be able to stay uh, just to let you know. <laughs> oh, as long as you can. Yeah, um, I gotta go have supper. Right. Well, um, what it is, because there are all only new visitors today. No, there is a few returners. Not many people had seen the previous recordings of this blub that I've been teaching. So all questions that are inspired by the title are very welcome. What, what would it uh, inspire in you, um, Nick, if you heard the title Biblical Entrepreneurship for the first time? What would you think of? I was actually thinking of trying operating a business uh, with biblical, um, you know, in with Bible principles. Yeah, that pretty much sums it up entirely. And uh, do you yourself run or observe a business? Are you part of an entrepreneurial venture like church building, church planting? Uh, not yet. <laughs> so. A, that means that you are already thinking about it somewhat. In a sense, yeah. We, we want to do it in a very unconventional way. Uh, but we have somebody who's got the entrepreneurship in that area whom uh, we're uh, <coughs> wanting to get in contact with. Right. So you already have experienced people on your team who have um, biblical entrepreneurship experience. I believe so, yes, yes. Right. What I do here most of the time is to help people to get to know that it actually exists, that there are individuals and organizations out there that successfully can Im apply um, Bible principles to their business, that there is a relevance of the Bible in our business and our business. There is a biblical reverence of our business as well. God wants us to do business. He wants us to be profitable. And um, very many Christians nowadays think, oh, I don't care about profit. I just, I just let follow God and I do whatever God wants me to do. Well, the first thing God wants us to do is to read his word, right? And in his word... There is a very significant and much often overlooked and misunderstood um, parable given by Jesus of the three servants. One of them is given five talents. The second one is given two talents. And the third one is given only one talent. And I don't know why, but business people never seem to remember that this actually even exists. Even though they are Bible-loving business people, they did not pay attention to the fact that God is actually giving us business instruction in his parables. When Jesus tells about the Lord who has three servants, gives one of them five talents, the second one three talents, two talents, and the third one one talent. And then he goes for a journey immediately. Upon his return, he asked them what did they do with the talents. And most of the people, most, mostly in church interpretations, it's considered to be a lofty making use of your gifts. Now, it is true that it is named talent and for good reason. We are all given talents by the ultimate creator. But it is given to them as money, as coin, for a reason. You're supposed to make profit of your talents and return it to your, to your um, Lord. Oh, sorry, Nick, you had to go. But thank you for coming all together. Thank you very much. In... Um, that parable, the landlord is specifically asking every, each and every one of them how did they profit on the talents they were given. And the first one was able to double it. The second one was able to double it. Therefore, they entered the joy of the Lord. 
But the third one has not profited. He even accused the Lord to be um, a shrewd Lord who wants to reap whatever he had not sown. Therefore, he's being punished by taking away his talent and thrown out into the wilderness, but there is gnashing of teeth. If that is not a wake-up call for a, a, a Christian person who owns a business or even a Christian person in general, then I don't know what possibly could be a wake-up call. How much more, literally, God could have explained it to you that we are all expected to be profitable. And our business is our primary medium to be profitable. Anybody here would like to take Nick's place up on air? Please just call in and join in because um, today we have Q&A. And I will be answering questions. I've not prepared a presentation. I've just been inspired to talk. Well, if you feel you would like to join in on air, just let me know. So that is, um, that was the parable of the three servants and their talents. And in general, to describe biblical entrepreneurship. Entrepreneurship is a word itself has been coiled in the 17th century France. It has been a lot older. In fact, from the appearance of man, of man on earth has already required the first man to be a seasoned entrepreneur. But the word entrepreneur in its current con uh, context has been coiled in the 17th century in the Industrial Revolution. It's, um, he is a bridge between the producers and the capital because it is the entrepreneur who connects money with service and connects service with customer, with the, with the one that needs the service. And it is the entrepreneur who has the compassion and the enthusiasm, sometimes paying even the ultimate price to deliver the solution to its customers. Okay, let's see the questions that are showing up here. Bye, Nick. That parable had nothing to do with business, but about the spreading and preaching of the good news. Well, you are free to think so, dear sir, but the talent supposed to be made profitable and your business is supposed to be rooted in your talents. You got to use your talent in order to serve others. I have, uh, if you could describe a little more for me why you don't think it has anything to do with business, I would appreciate it. But as far as I understand, there is in current society a great split between understanding what business is. Business is nothing else than doing service to others for profit. And God wants you to be profitable. I pray the Holy Spirit lead you and use you in Jesus' name. Thank you very much, Nick. I really hope that it is not a final goodbye. I want to see you again. How did he explain it, though? G. Brina. I am not sure what you are referring to. Would you be so kind to actually write down the full question so that I could comprehend you? Why do Christians believe everything good is God-given? Because God's name is good. God's name is good. Everything apart from 
good is not good. That's the simple explanation. Dr. Zhivago and Chris A. Ashby. Nice to see you here. Why do Christians believe everything good is God-given? Because God is the provider of good. That's his name. Apart from him, nothing good exists. And in him, there is absolutely nothing that's not good. But if you are not connected to God, does that mean you are not good? Yes, that's exactly the definition of sin. Um, God loves the sinner, but hates the sin. And in order for you to be good, you're going to have to acknowledge and repent the things that are not good about you. Because ultimately, Gibrina, nobody is perfect. And until you know what your imperfections are, you don't even have a hope to commune with what is perfect. Um, therefore, repentance is essential for you to become intimate with God. You have to recognize what those things are that are not perfect about you. Once you have repented them to the perfect one, then you created a relationship and um, um, what is it called? Intimacy with God. One person can think something is good and another person thinks it is bad. But ultimately, people who think that truth and good and bad are subjective and don't believe in a higher power, they basically think that there is nothing better judge in this world than I. That is putting your place in the place of God who sees the whole much bigger picture. Are you able to see the whole world all at one glance? I don't believe so. You also only see in part. If you believe there is no such a thing as objective truth, then you believe that you can see everything, all good and all bad, all at once with your own eyes. If you're capable of doing that, I will test you on being God. And I might credit you the certificate of God, Godhood. But no, there is no human being who is capable of comprehending all that is good and bad all at a glance. Uh, how do you know God's will? That's right. That is an incredibly good question. Well, first of all, the very popular answer to that, that I sometimes like to challenge, but it is noteworthy, is that when you are doing God's will, you feel joy and passion for doing it. But that can be over-romanticized. Very often, we need to start out with baby steps and to do what is not comfortable, but it is God's will. Why? Because the human ego is a very stubborn part of our constitution. We cannot just throw it away all at once. It has to be conquered gradually and surrendered every day anew. Gibrina. But what about all of the beautiful, kind, caring, and amazing, talented people praying to, to another God through no fail of their own? That they are all doomed and are ultimately evil? Very harsh for me. You know, where is your source? Let's just look at it. Um, if you go to a poison, poisoned well to draw water, and you go to a fresh well to draw water, 
Probably this poison you won't even notice it is in the water. But Satan was there to poison it anyway. Therefore, you need to be very careful which well you go to. Unfortunately, the wet. Satan did poison a well, and that well is going to kill you. That doesn't matter how much goodness you have in your heart. If you do not testify for the God who created and put that goodness into your heart, if you don't confess to that God, then you are still drawing from the poisoned well. Um, unfortunately, that's the constitution of this world, your source, that is matter. You need to know where you draw the water from. It, it does not mean that God's people, Jesus came into this world in the first place because God's people have wandered away. They have become lost. They were the lost sheep. And they needed to be taught and guided back to the one true well to drink from. The one that has no poison in it. Satan is very tactful, very intelligent, and very deceitful. It can draw you to the well that is ultimately going to kill you. That is his goal. That's what he wants. He wants to deceive you so that you would be murdered. God does not murder you. God does not convict you to death. God is calling you to the well where he put the essential of everlasting life into the water. It is, it is the human condition. It is part of the human condition that you need to learn to um, discern whose call you validate as your God. Are you going to validate Satan's voice and ultimately die at the end of the journey? Or are you going to validate God's voice as the creator of all good and healing and go to the well that he provided for you with the waters of everlasting life? That's the choice we make every day as human beings. God's will is found in his book, the Bible. Absolutely, Eliezer. Thank you very much for saying that. We go back with every thought to the Bible and keep it captive. We capture it with the words of the Bible. We test it against the words of the Bible. We try it by the words of the Bible. And when it passes all the trials, then that thought is valid. Glenn Underwood, how do you know it's God's word because it says so? Are you referring to the Bible, Glenn, or are you referring to God's word in general? That's my question for you. Because if you are referring to the words of the Bible, yes, we consider it the word of God because God says so. so. And if you believe that God is truth, then it cannot lie. I don't care how you name your God, but if you know that your God testifies and stands for and is the substance of truth, then truth cannot lie. Uh, God, and guess what? It is available for anyone who is hungry to seek God out for themselves through his word. Absolutely. I think, Eliezer, you are aching to come up on air with me. You are very welcome to join me on air if you wanted to call in. Glenn Underwood, it has not been tested to be infallible. There are countless discrepancies. Well, that is a whole study in itself, Glenn, and that is the study of the prophecies. God has not given human beings the prophecies as a fortune teller gives you a reading. God has given his people the prophecies to prove it to them 
that his word is indeed unfailable. And I will be really happy to discuss that in a different um, conversation because that is a huge topic. And um, I would like to dedicate several hours just to that one topic. I will be more than happy to prepare that sometime and put it on the schedule. So keep an eye out, Glenn, because I will be calling you up as the person who would like to interview me on God's prophecies in the Bible to prove its relevance and unfailability. Hi, Sydney. Nice to have you here. Gibrina. So if God loves everyone, why did he do that? He could have made a world where there was easily no cancer in children, no disease, and no Christians. Answer to it is usually he. It, the, usually it is that he gave us free will. Well, remember, Jibrina, if you have ever read the Bible, you know exactly that God has created a perfect world. It's not only that God had given us free will. And that's why the, all the bad things have entered life. But because God and his people have an enemy. And it is not right to attribute the, the negative aspects of worldly life to God. Because that is um, the consequences of having an evil enemy in this world as the prince of this world called Satan. He has been um, shunned out of heaven and sent to earth. This is his only dwelling place until his days is up. Human beings have chosen to come to live on earth by disobeying God. It was the consequences of that free will. But free will does not necessarily have to have bread consequences. Free will could have been resulting in everlasting obedience, which is our salvation today, because Jesus, he's returned to us that privilege of using our free will for ultimate obedience to God's will. It does not have to end in uh, being under the rulership and the influence of evil. That is. God has to also respect that the evil enemy, it, it, this world is he, Satan's uh, portion to live right now. And once God is done demonstrating it to the entire universes of many other universes, how evil is evil. And when they all have understood the consequences of evil, like the experiment of good and evil battling here on earth, when all those universes have learned from the example of man is as a free-willed human being in the midst of the controversy of good and evil, then God will end the battle because he already won the battle. And he already created that perfect world where there are no cancer in children and there is no sickness and illness and there is no suffering but we cannot go to that world until the demonstration is over what happened to the end of mark why does jesus not explicitly refer to himself in the earliest gospels like mark and luke why is the story of jesus and the casting the first stone not in the early, I would love to, earliest manuscript, refer to himself as God in the earliest manuscript, earliest gospels I meant. Sorry, typing on phone. Sorry, Glenn. Um, I would really love to uh, refer to your question. I just don't really comprehend where you are coming from. Yes, God, uh, Jesus called, names himself, I am that I am. He is that ultimate I am. He is the son of God. And he entered into the physical body to be the son of man. But I'm not quite sure what your question is referring to or what is it questioning, really. Eliezer, will you believe if Jesus shows up in your bedroom tonight? 
Yes. Yes, Eliezer. <laughs> but actually, no. I would be, not in my bedroom, Eliezer. Not in my bedroom. Because, yes, I would believe if Jesus showed up tonight, but not in my bedroom. Because that's not what my Bible says. He that my Bible does not say that my creator will come back for me in my bedroom. The Bible says that there will be a huge cry in the skies and he will be coming wrapped in clouds. Now, there are denominations who think and they are expecting Jesus showing up in a beautiful, idealistic daylight sky where there are these cozy little um cotton ball uh, clouds floating by. But I also read the Old Testament and I have pictured for myself the sanctuary. And I have understood that God's presence was dwelling in the dark cloud, in the smoky cloud. Now, I would like to challenge you, Eliezer. Is Jesus going to show up in a smoky cloud looking like a hurricane or is he going to show up in a lofty blue sky with cotton ball clouds what would you vote for where would you be expecting him and if you want ready to answer the question i would like you to show up on air i cannot exhaust this topic with you in the chat box if you would like this answer to be question discussed any further Please come on air. <laughs> he says, so ask him and it shall be so. Well, Jesus has already prophesied that he's going to be coming in the cloud in a loud noise that even wakes up the dead from their graves. Okay, says Glenn. I would love to hear more of your questions, Glenn. I just don't really, I wasn't able to understand it well enough. England Studio, question again. Wow, I'm not quite sure what you are referring to. Elisa, nice try. You are trying to pull me in. Well, I that is an exciting question. That is actually a very respectful question of my faith. And I would love to chat with you on that one, but not in the box. It's really a big topic. But if you wanted to share your thoughts about um, how God is going to show up, how Jesus is going to show up, you are welcome to come on air. What was your... Mm. In Mark, Jesus doesn't explicitly refer to himself as God like he does in John. Mark is the earliest gospel. Yes. So you do know uh, the scriptures very well. And yes, that is two different interpretations of two witnesses. But we know that um, Jesus refers to himself as I am that I am, the Son of God and the Son of Man. If you would like to break it down to different Gospels, that is a question that I would have to research for myself and observe what I might discover. I, I wouldn't just want to improvise an answer there. And I will love to answer that question too. In fact, I take a note for myself. If you are referring to the rapture, he will appear in the sky with a shout and a trumpet sounding. That's true. He's going to appear in the sky with a shout that even wakes up the dead and with the trumpets sounding. I personally do not call it uh, rapture because rapture is a very loaded word that is used in um, many um, Protestant churches 
to an entirely different concept that what I understand Jesus is telling about his appearance. The way Jesus describes his appearance is not the same as what the most um, modern Protestant churches are teaching. And therefore, I refrain from using the word rapture. I call it second coming, just as the Bible calls it. So um, maybe maybe that makes it a little clear for you, Eliezer, that there is um, a perception difference between the second coming and rapture. And if you like, again, please come on air and we can discuss it further. Jebrina, if you were born in China, you would be a Buddhist. How can you prove to God you are worthy of making it to his perfect world if you were put into the wrong part of the world? Well, sweetheart, I have got a real surprise for you. First of all, in whatever Asian country you are put to, you can choose between religions there too. There is no entirely inscribed, you are not born with a religion. You are um, trained for a religion. And as far as for myself, I was born in a Hungary in the mid 70, 70s into a family and a culture that never even mentioned the word God. I grew up without the Bible. I was 19 and I left my own country to look for this mythological figure called, called God. And I, all I took with me was a Hungarian version of the Bible. So I would understand the English speakers and their Bible in, in a more direct fashion because my English was very poor at the time. So my transformation proves it that you are not a victim of your culture. It is a choice. You have a free will, especially today with um, technological advancements. There is no way that anybody in any part of the world could grow up without ever being heard from God and about his name and about his word and about his name of Jesus. Those people who don't hear about it in very remote parts of the world also being seeked out by missionaries and sooner or later in their lifetime will be confronted with the question, are you willing to show up for God because he just showed up for you? So no, there is no excuses. Cultural influence is an excuse and not a reason. I'm missing out on many of the questions because you are submitting it so wonderfully fast. I'm sorry if I can't answer every one of them, but I try to. God always looks at the heart. The thief on the cross is just like someone born in a Buddhist country. That's right. In the last second of your life, suffering alongside Jesus, you still can submit your life to him. That's right. The second is always better. Young idealist. Wow, I wonder what that might mean. But I applaud you, applaud you with your courage of writing a sentence. All right. Any more questions? I'm kind of Looks like I have, and this is all I see. Oh, wonderful. Uh, here on the map, I can see where are we? Where are, oh, we have several people from the United States, from the UK. If a person is sincerely convinced that a God does not exist, can they choose to believe that it exists anyway? Yes, any time. You, I have no idea how the Holy Spirit does that. But if the Holy Spirit approaches you and you recognize him, 
you will change your mind in the in a second i believe that i live as a roommate with a 76 year old man who is an atheist he has been an atheist all his life so has been his entire family but i believe that i live with him so that he would still have a chance every single day of his life that is left of it to finally come to the recognition of God's existence and submit and 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 con convey it with his own mouth someday I believe in that Steve oh yeah I think I just answered that question anybody would like to join me on air for a dialogue. Well, it has been a um, great time answering your religion and faith-based questions. But if you uh, notice my specialty within the Christian faith is biblical entrepreneurship. I wonder if I will be receiving any questions regarding the title. It's a different question, please read it. Oh, if a person is sincerely convinced that a God does exist, can they choose to believe that, that it does not exist anyway? Yes, we are confronted by that question every single day of our lives. We recommit to our faith probably every day, and there are crisis times in our life when we recommit again. And hopefully, this is, this is why it is so important to pray for the souls of our own salvation and others to remain faithful till the end of times. Because however great is your faith, at some point, you will be tempted with um, apostasy. It is inevitable. And what choice you will make there and then depends how prepared were you. Somewhere, somewhere along the way, in the times of being tempted by apostasy, you will have to search your soul very carefully and, um, and find God for yourself, by yourself, without any external support. That is the true test of life. That is the real true test. And I had to tell that from time to time, I have been tested so such a way, never too sharply. I mean, I have never gone overboard, but I have been tested. Yes. Okay. I find it hard to agree with your claim that people can change their beliefs so fluidly if i choose to believe something i am not convinced of i would think myself lacking in integrity not necessarily not necessarily um it it is a constant test and a constant testimony if you ever been challenged with new information or new influence in your life that just suddenly made put everything into a whole new concept and changed your world upside down, there is possible that that actually a new integrity can emerge, a new kind of integrity in your soul. If you are an atheist, it is quite possible to find, uh, have an experience where, and, and you can be, you can have a complete integrity as an atheist in your soul and can have an experience that is going to reconstruct your entire soul immediately. It is just like in chemistry how the molecules can change and reorganize themselves and become 
a completely new element. Just think about that. God is showing this around us in nature and science in, in billions of many different ways. Gibrina, I want to believe, but it is just so hard to believe in, in something that sounds so fake, considering we evolved from monkeys and dinosaurs were before them. This wasn't a world made for us only. That's right. And um, it, it, call it a fake world. It is very accurate. This is a world of illusions and delusions because this is, this is Satan's territory. But I have to pick, up, pick you up on the statement that we have evolved from monkeys and before them dinosaurs have lived there. Gibrina, if we evolve from monkeys, then why the monkeys in Africa today are still monkeys? Why don't they keep turning into human beings? That's my question for you. Really? I have never seen a monkey turning into an ape like meaning um, a more human-like homo sapiens. That is, and if, I, I just really would like to know how do we imagine a monkey turning into a homo sapiens. We will run out of monkeys. My questions were asking with that new information. Does that change your answers? Yes, sometimes events can take place in the soul itself too, with that external input. This is why I personally love to spend time by myself and contemplate and um, reorganize my internal existence just by sitting still, because at some point we need to process everything that we experience in life. And in those moments when you are alone in a retreat, away from in nature, the very um, experiences that you had in this very life can have a whole new meaning, can rearrange themselves into a whole new complex, and you can still call that an integrity. You don't even need an external input because we get so much experience in the time of a lifetime or in a year even that many people cannot even handle it and they really get confused and broken people and some struggle with mental illness. Processing experiences in our life is absolutely essential. This is why the Bible says in Revelation that at the end of the days, the people of the beasts will find no rest. Reserving time for rest and processing our own life experiences is essential for the health of the soul and essential for finding God and communing and being intimate with God. What are you describing is not an accurate description of evolution. No animals are transformed instantaneously, but they don't transform slowly either. We haven't seen a monkey turning into a human being or a homo sapiens in at least the last 2000 years. Have you had any reports on slow transformations? I would like you to give me that report because I would be really curious. Gibrina, they are changing, but the time of change takes millions of years of evolving, just like our arms were much longer in the past. And it is proven that our heads are getting larger over time. It's fact. Well, if you think that the length of your arms and the size of your head is what makes you human, then you won the debate. 
I don't believe that the length of my arm and the proportions of my body and my head is what makes me human. That's not what I consider as a definition of human. Dinosaurs were before us. So is God a dinosaur? Was the world made for them? When God created the world according to my Bible, he never mentioned dinosaurs. It's not that they did not exist, but I am not considering it um, part of his report. Evolution does not claim that we are evolved from monkeys. Uh, we evolved from a common ancestor which resembled monkeys more, but they were not monkeys. All right. But you know what? I would like to see on the evolution uh, charts, the different animal groups that have shared ancestors. There is no reported transformation that changes the species in the entire um, tree of uh, the life of biological life of this earth. If you can report it to me that that um, the rabbits that horses and deers have evolved from um, the ancestor of the rabbits is still change still that rabbit is turning into uh, evolving into deers and horses, then I will reconsider my statement. But as far as I know, on the evolutionary biological tree of spe species, there have not been reported any um, species change. They are changing, but essentially they remain the same species. Eliezer, so are dinosaurs the authors of evolution? I have never said that. I don't know whom you are asking the question for from Eliezer. I'm convinced that the archaeologists and anthropologists' um, discoveries of dinosaur remains are genuine. It is just not part of the creation story, therefore I have no information of. God has given us the Bible as a basic instructions before leaving earth. He never claimed that it was everything that there is to know. He just basically claims that this is what's necessary to know. Oh, asking Jibrina. Okay, you can do that too. But... Yes, I would like to distinguish here that there are informations um, given by God that is, even in the Bible it says, if everything that was to know was written down in, the, in books and scrolls, then even heaven could not contain all the knowledge because there is so much. God cannot burden our little brains with more than one basic instruction book and a manual, he he's not giving us information to fulfill our curiosities. He's giving us information to help us become better human beings. And my, by better, I mean we come into this world as dying. When we are born, the minute we are born, we start dying. But connecting with the source of everlasting life through accepting the blood of Jesus Christ, our soul can be saved. Not our carnal bodies, but our soul. And that can be quickened through the word of God. And that's the kind of everlasting life that I am rooting for, for myself and for others. Jibrina says, no, but to say the world was made for us is silly. 
It clearly wasn't because we are just another form of animal. Christians claim to have the answer, but since is asking why, how, and really. Yes, Gibrina, that is right on my topic. Human beings were not called and created just to be, um, we were created to dominate, but the domination was limited to stewardship. Human beings are the keepers of the earth, keepers of God's creation. Our duty is to um, husband the creation of earth, husband the animals, take care of nature. Adam was put in charge of the garden. Adam was supposed to take care of the garden. Therefore, yes, I agree with you, uh, Gibrina. This is not a world made for men, and look what we are making of it. We turned earth into our slave, and it's turning into, we are very, very bad husbands. We are very, very bad gardeners. We are very, very bad stewards of the treasures and the resources and the beauty of earth. I agree with you on that. And, but that can be changed. And why it is on my topic because this is the essence of biblical entrepreneurship. Biblical entrepreneurs are not for-profit earth users. Biblical entrepreneurs are builders of God's kingdom and keepers of the earth. Stewards of God's ta given talents, resources, and gifts. So would dolphins, if they could communicate like us? Yes, I totally agree with that one because I live in Hawaii. And the whole reason I came here, because I loved dolphins and coming, always living inland away from the oceans. Um, I have never even encountered those animals. And I came to Hawaii because I was curious about dolphins. And I have the opportunity now to go out and swim with the dolphins anytime I want. And there have been occasions when I had more extraordinary experiences than other times. And believe it or not, it is, it is a whole different sense to be around dolphins than other animals. But other animals have their wonderful vibration too. But if you go under, dive under the water and you listen to the, 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 the dolphins whistling to each other and calling for each other. I don't know what that means, young idealist. I don't understand your shorthand. You're going to have to write me proper words. Sorry about that. Um, dolphins communicate through whistles and crickle, crickles or whatever they call them. And when I was in the midst of a pod on a beautiful day, I did not hear them with my ears, sweetheart. I heard them with the middle of my head. And sometimes I still have that extraordinary experience. I can, it's almost like it's so in the center of my head as if the dolphins would want to show me where my sonar is. And I know that God has given different abilities to different species that no at least one talent to each species that no other species has in the whole wide world in the creation. And if dolphins, if that special gift of dolphins is their sonar, I found that. And, and it is in the middle of my head. I did not understand the language. I haven't spent enough time with them and I would never claim that kind of experience, but I know they have a language because it was vibrating in the middle of my head in, in, the, in the skull. Okay, after dolphins. You seem to be skipping my explanations of evolution. I don't know. I must have missed it because the questions come up on my chat box so fast that I don't manage to answer 
one question all the way before they show up. So would you mind to ask me again about your question of evolution? I have already, um, it, and actually it would be much better, Steve, if you would come up on air and we could have a conversation about it. I'm totally open to that as well. It's a bit exhausting to communicate the chat box. Asmania Gibrina, but they don't have a holy book. They know what to do. Okay, Gibrina, I like your question, but it disappeared on me. Yeah, I can't go back. I don't know how to read questions that I have. Gibrina, I ha I'm not able to read your text because it went off my screen. I don't. Why don't you come up and we talk about it? Young idealist. But if you are referring to that the um, dolphins, they know the truth and they are intimately connected to the creator and his truth. Um, without even um and they can tell good from evil and okay jibrina your question is so exciting but i can't read it what i can tell you is that all of creation all of its animals are innocent the only sinner in this world is man when man sinned god cursed the earth and everything that lived in it. The animals are cursed because of man, because man was a bad steward and sinned. But animals themselves are all innocent. Therefore, they don't even need to make a choice between good and evil. They are, they are, their goodness is preserved in the hands of God. I, and and innocent and the innocent animals often become a prey to the ev the teeth of evil. Hi, Steve. Hi, Hi are you outside um, somewhere on your phone? <laughs> yeah, is that okay? <laughs> yes, that's fine. Um, okay, Whatever so, makes you comfortable. Yeah, I just <laughs> wanted to explain something because I know this isn't the major. Uh, focus of your blab, but um, I'm a, a science uh, tutor, and I just wanted to clarify some some common misunderstandings about what evolution claims. So, when we're talking about um, the slow changes you're, you you mentioned, that's from a generation to generation standpoint, mm -hmm. right? So, if you look at um, dog breeds, right? we bred humankind has a history of breeding dogs into uh, which originally came from wolves you understand that much right mm, not really agree with that either if uh, you look at evolution like classifications <clears throat> wolves and dogs have come inherently from different ancestors as well so you 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 believe that your god created dogs and no. wolves separately Yes, but is in that, evolution, that, in evolutional chart, they are not exactly the same species. Uh, actually, I would disagree with you there, but uh, we we'd need to look at sources to to verify. But the the point is, is that according to evolution, they do in fact share common ancestors, regardless of whether they've been deemed separate species yet. The point at which the two become separate species for for science is generally around the time when one population and another population, though they came from the same ancestor population, they can no longer interbreed anymore. Their genes are too different for them to produce viable offspring. Well, we have this in the case um, for a few species, like if you look at butterflies in um, Africa, you can actually take a, a chain of one species of butterfly. Well, scientists have studied a chain of, of butterflies across the whole continent of Africa, where this same species of butterfly, if you try to breed them when you found them, say, about 10 miles apart, 
um, you could make a chain going all across Africa where each um, two individuals that were 10 miles apart could, um, could produce viable offspring. But when you try to mate them while they're too far apart, we're talking like 100 miles apart, they no longer are capable of producing um, viable offspring. Okay, so I need this to make is it, one of many I need to make it a little the, bit the, more so. relatable to myself and I would say I can relate way better to the farm animals of horses and donkeys. When you enter um, when they are being how do you call it um, Okay, yeah, yeah. It um, becomes horses a mule, and donkeys. right? It becomes a mule. Right. And, and a the mule, mule becomes mule. infertile. It's not yes. fertile. Mule yes, exactly. is not fertile, right? But a horse is. Exactly. And the donkey is. Right. So a mule is an example of what's known as a hybrid, where yes. the two populations, or the two populations of species, are distant enough to produce enough complications so that the mule cannot uh, further produce viable offspring. But if you let some time go by where the two species um, continue, to not be able to interbreed because of, because of the mule, eventually, after enough time goes by and their DNA through natural selection changes, they don't even have to physically change all that much. Their DNA just has to change over time. And eventually, what will happen is that the two species will no longer even produce the mule. Yes, and In fact, here you are... Many you're not actually, I have the feeling you're proving my point. Now, not to be impatient, the first time in my life I'm trying to formulate this. Because, mm -hmm. because if evolution was true, then there is two species that cannot produce a fertile um, offspring. Can you show me one example of... Because well, I, this is this is a little bit over my head, but I'm Sorry, but I and what I feel because what was my point earlier is that monkeys do not we don't see monkeys becoming Homo sapiens right or cavemen, not in short time right. immediately, what and we, we also is, don't see them over thousands of years. There has not been reported one example. Right. Of it. Can you give me one example right. of that two far away species? when they are bred together into a hybrid like this, and they all of a sudden show up fertile. That the mule all of a sudden will show up fertile. Did that change in the last two to 3,000 well, years? Well, that, that would not be what you would expect. For, like you would, you would expect that it would maintain that the two um, would most likely remain infertile. Like, according to evolution like that that, that, that that the hybrid won't reproduce a viable offspring and that it will get worse and worse over time but if you could look back if, if that's what you're saying look back and see some some uh say donkey and horse breeds uh breeding together and produce producing viable offspring and then that later changing to where they didn't any longer? Is that the kind of example? Yes, um, if that was evolution and then it would make it possible between two, two. Is there any new species born that you are aware of that is, can be proven that did not exist thousands of years ago? It's my question. I mean, now I'm starting to get asking questions okay. that I don't okay. know the answer for. So, so here's, here's, here's the thing about that. Like we still have to we have to maintain uh, where you would be willing to agree at what the difference between two species would be. And then we would follow until we see enough difference between two, two family lines of, of a species to see enough difference to convince you. I now, totally now what I was agree saying is, with the definition of two different um, species that when they, in, they cross mate, then they cannot produce an uh, viable offspring or they cannot cannot produce a fertile offspring because in the, sp in okay. the case I of the mule it, it, it i would say that is viable offspring but it's not fertile and that that i would still consider horses and donkeys to be two completely different 
species, horses and, and, and zebra is two different species, even though they have a common ancestor. Okay, so so um, my, my point, to, to show you that example, I think if this is what you're asking for, that's, that's what you get from the studies of butterflies in Africa, where if they're a certain distance apart, they can't produce offspring or viable offspring. But if they are close, they can. And, and the same study has also been done with salamanders on the coast of, of, um, of uh, South Africa, uh, no, South America. Along the coast of South America, throughout the entire continent, scientists have, have tried to produce um, offspring for salamanders from different points in, uh, along the coast. If they measure, if they, if the two salamanders come from within a certain distance, they can produce a uh, viable offspring, but go beyond that difference and they no longer can produce uh, that, that distance. They can no longer produce generation viable offspring. Generation later, a few generation later, they become infertile, right? No, it's not a few generations later. It's that the, the populations. So you have a general population that's say on the east um, uh, coast of South America and a general population that's on the west coast of South, South America. You can make a chain of this salamander going all around the coast to find a viable offspring between salamanders from, from different points. As long as they're close together, you can make the chain. But if you try to breed from the east coast to the west coast, they're too far away. Their, their populations the have been species? separate. Is it the same species? It is the same species. Same yeah, species. it's the same species. You can go all, all the way around the coast, uh, making but a chain how does that, to show that how they does can... that actually prove off. the theory of evolution? Because there is, there is a species, and however ways you cross um, breed them... Cross breed them, right. Do you ever produce a new species? Is the mule have the chance of ever becoming a species in itself? No, because no, it's no. Not. and you wouldn't expect it to because it can't reproduce. But does it prove your point of evolution? Um, by itself, I wouldn't say it's sufficient, but it does. It is a piece of evidence for evolution because because. My my problem is we already have at least two to three thousand years of natural history evidences and historical historically for about like 500 years of reporting uh, animals around the world. Um, have you found any significant in, in, in changes? Because evolution always comes with these minute little ch changes that can only be you know, observed over thousands of times. But we have enough information already. Have we seen any new species no. occurring that could be proven is caused by evolution? Or it is all still just so, a theory? That's my problem with it. So, so let me just sort of suggest this. So you take... Um, you take a teacup poodle that could fit in the size of my hand, in, in the palm of my hand. And while you would say they're not uh, sharing common ancestors with wolves, you would agree that the teacup poodle shares a common an ancestor with, say, um, a hound, right? Or... Um, uh, I don't, I don't the, exactly the, know the history and evolution is not my expertise. I have gone from my, um, to my convictions in a different way. I'm happy to have this conversation because I find it fascinating, but I don't have a biological background to know the whole family tree of dogs. I, I would say that between a tiny little dog and a huge big dog, there is, must be some ancestral difference. <laughs> difference. Hi, Maya. Hi, Maya. Hi, right. hi so, JD. So Sorry for not addressing this. If you, if you want to see... So now we are through the end. Sorry. Um, yes, get your point. I, 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 I I'm, can't see. Okay. I, I, I don't have JD. a valuable uh, input okay. here. Just that's what I'm trying to convey. Okay. Um, I, I thought there was some echo going on here. So anyway, go ahead, Steve. I think you hadn't finished your point yet, Steve. Yeah, okay, I, need, I need to refresh. Okay. Maya, can you hear me? 
Yes, I hear you very well. Very good. Um, I I actually am uh, a biologist, and so oh, I, wonderful. I am well versed in um, uh, biological evolution. And I think what you may have been asking was, do we have any actual evidence, or have has anybody witnessed one species turning into another species? Has that been witnessed within has human lifetimes? Has it been reported? Yes. That, and, that, and the answer is yes. Many. Wonderful. Many, Please many, tell many me times. About and, it. and I can give you, and but see, uh, it is a very, th these things do take a very, very long time to change from one species to, to, to another. Sometimes it takes hundreds of thousands of years. Uh, it all depends on the length of the generation of the animal. For instance, if it's if it's a human, we live to be 70 years. So we have, it takes many, many generations. Well, that's a long time. But if it's an animal that has a very short lifespan, its generations can happen like, say, a fruit fly. Its generation is a month or less. But however, uh, in higher animals like vertebrates, animals with backbones, um, there, there are even in those animals, there, there are examples of where, where we have witnessed, humans have witnessed what they call speciation. And speciation means the creation of an, one species out of an, another. And it's kind of like a divergence, a splitting off. And one good example is of a type of house mouse. You know, the little ones that get in the house that you try to get rid of when you, you know, the one of the most common house mouse mouses mice of the world is the European house mouse. But when people first settled in the Faroe, F A R O E islands in north in the North Atlantic, unfortunately they brought with this island. The Faroe Islands did not have any native mice, native house mice. They brought with them the European house mouse, and it took about three hundred years. But because of the isolation, the genetic isolation on this island compared to all of the European house mouse, they became genetically, essentially genetically, uh, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Unique. Is it because called mutation? Is it they, called mutation? They, they mutated and, and the, ge the genes were not shared with the European population because of the separation because they're on an island and eventually they and the conditions are very different on these colder islands so eventually what happened is they changed morphology which is how they look that doesn't necessarily mean it's a different species but they also can, now they cannot interbreed successfully mm -hmm. with and produce fertile offspring with the original population. And this is called speciation. And that is just one of many, many examples of observed speciation. Usually it's, like I said, though, it's usually observed in laboratory situations where there are, um, you can have, you can utilize animals that have very quick generations because we're people, we don't have a lot of time to look at these things. But this, it's, and this one is a, is, like I said, it's a mouse, and it took 300 years for that to happen. But that shows you that, that evolution requires deep time, very deep yeah. time. I have a question. Yes, please. Um, can you please explain me how speciation and the principles of evolution happens to disapprove the existence and the work of God? How does it disapprove creation? It does not, it does not, disp well, you know, no, 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 well, let, let me explain though. Yeah. It, ha it has nothing to do with that question. It doesn't have anything, it doesn't disprove it and it doesn't prove it. It, it is, there are two separate things. It's, it's, it's like, it's like saying. Two different phenomena, like evolution is a completely independent ev from God. Ev evolution, evolution, and when you break it down to what it truly is. And I'm talking about when I talk about evolution, there are two theories. By the way, there's no such thing as just a theory. A theory in science is you spell it with a capital T. It means the, the most, it most 
It is the most that we can know about a phenomenon, a, a, an observed physical phenomenon, because it is a model that we create that is built on a foundation of facts, and we use it for its predictive value. So, and, um, and it doesn't mean, so when, you, so when something is just a theory, you have to say then that gravity is just a theory, because gravity is a theory. But we uh, actually, I I would like to definitely rephrase that one because theory, the word theo means God. So I would, I I, I personally would put a lot more emphasis on um, idea. Mm -hmm. Is is this just an idea? But no, you have proven to me. You are bringing examples for me that it is not just an idea. It actually has been witnessed and recorded. Now, my question is, if evolution is independent from God's creation theory. Uh, by the way, there is no creation theory. I, I, there, is no, there is no creation theory, and I'll tell you why. Okay, I disagree with that one, but just go ahead, bring your, I haven't heard your a alternative theory, a, th a theory is a very distinct thing. It's not, it's not a word that it has fuzzy edges to it. It is a very distinct thing. Okay, a, what is your definition theory, of theory? No, well, not my definition of it. I'm talking about theory with the scientific theory. It is a okay. very, it is, and what a theory is, it has, it is a statement that must be falsifiable. And by what I mean by falsifiable, there must be some kind of test out there that you can run on the thesis of that theory that can prove that that can that can disprove that theory with evolution there's any number of hundreds of things that can disprove it but none ever have but but it but there are experiments one can design that if evolution failed then ev you'd have to scrap the theory it never has failed um now there is no theory for the existence of god because, because God, God is not falsifiable. Can you tell me of a test that you can run that would disprove the existence of God? I can tell you why there is uncertainty about the existence of God. Well, no, I, that's not the question. Is there a test, an experiment that, you, that a person or anybody or a group of people can conduct this experiment, and when the, the results of the experiment are in, can definitively say, God does not exist. No, there is no exactly, such thing. Exactly, exactly. There is none. So, God, the existence of God is not a theory, so it's not science. Now, that's okay. That's okay that it's not science. You take the word theo, which means actually literally God, and use it for Using it to define see, science, you know, you know, you know, you know what? Um, to unprove God. That, that, no, see, see, you're taking the the etiology of a word and trying to transpose it on its current meaning. Words, words themselves evolve and have and change meaning. Which is why we need to know where they come from, what their root is. Well, well, exactly, and, and I I understand the root of the word is God. That's okay, but that's not what it means today. Okay, I will challenge you. Have you ever seen a tree that had the the roots of an apple and the fruit of a plum? Yes. That is like what is it called? Engrafted. Grafted. But of if it is an in, a tree of integrity that was the same seed and grown out of it, and it would bring different fruit than it was actually rooted the rest of the tree can an apple tree bear oranges uh not to my knowledge not to my knowledge no but i don't i i think it could be possible but i don't to my knowledge i don't think okay even even if the the, the i accept that language changes over time and we mean something very different by the word theory today than we are we meant at the when it was created Let's go back to the original discussion where, um, what was your question really when it, about the theory? Um, no, no, that there is no theory. To science and God. 
right? Um, you wanted me to bring you an example that of a test that disapproves God's existence. Therefore, it is not science, right? Yeah, um, just, yeah. Well, um, would you say that evolution is a process, therefore it requires time? Yes. Would you say, no, you would probably wouldn't. I don't know what your religious conviction is because I have not, we haven't discussed that one, didn't reveal it to us. But by the way I define creation is, that is immediate and complete. There is no necessity and there is no room for process. There is no room for progress. It's complete. It's perfect right away. Therefore, it does not exist in this world because we live in an imperfect world. This has Earth and uh, what we know of our universe has been designated by God for the existence of imperfection. How how do you define perfection? Very good question. I might have to think about that one. But um, well, well, because because, because Bible, that's, that that seems to be that seems to be a premise of your argument. So I'm going to hold mm-hmm. you to that because. So what is perfection? Perfection think, is the existence of God which I have no ways of proving or unproving. And this is what I would like, just a tiny little bit of your patience before I get interrupted, because I have tried to get it across for a while. Um, Oh, it flew my, (laughs) flew out of my head. Don't don't worry, it happens to me all the time. That, um, can you please ask the same question again? Uh, that will trigger what the, I was. The, I think the question I had asked you is how? Uh, how? What is? How do you define? Perf- what is perfection? Perfection that existence exists first of all outside of time. God is perfect, and that's therefore we cannot know Him in this world. Why not? And I have made this argument yesterday also, because we, what science can prove is certainty. And whatever it has questions, it will go and explore the answers until it can prove it and produce certainty. God does not want us to have certainty because in the presence of certainty, there cannot be uncertainty, which is the very substance of faith. Okay. There is no faith if there is certainty. And in order, in our Bible writes it, and I know if somebody doesn't prove the word of the Bible, is going to question my entire reasoning here. But uh, in Hebrews 11, it says that faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. Now, most people in with the secret... Um, community will say, oh, the things not seen is that you just need to visualize and hope for it and have faith. And eventually it's going to manifest into your life. But God is really, is he really concerned about you having another car or building a new house? God is not concerned with those things. What really matters to God is and is unseen in our world but is very precious to God, is the human soul. Is science have ever been able to prove the existence of soul? Don't answer yet, please, you can answer later. Now, in my opinion, even if it was proven by science, it's not visible for us now. Um, And I don't know how could science prove the existence of soul, but it's invisible. Therefore, faith, in my reasoning, that's really precious to God, my, my earth, human soul, is faith is the evidence. No, evidence is the substance of things not seen, substance of the soul, and the evidence of things uh, of not seen, which is actually, he talks here mm-hmm. about the human soul, because his point, he doesn't spell it out for us, 
God wants us to spend time in his word, in intimacy with him. He wants to have a relationship with him. He wants us to have so much faith and hope to be with him, so much enthusiasm and, and fire for him and determination to find him that we, we spend hours and hours and days and days surging his very word to discover these little secrets that are not obvious because if it was obvious and if it was certain it would not require faith and if the faith is the substance of the human soul and the evidence of the human soul then it is absolutely necessary for our everlasting life to have faith because if there is no faith there is no substance and we have nothing to hope for that's my evidence of God mm -hmm. wanting us to have a soul. And the soul is the very thing that is going to survive this earthly life. There is absolutely nothing else part. You leave behind your carnality. When Jesus saved us on the cross, he did not save the carnal human being. He saved the soul of the human being that is actually precious to him. And I will be happy to sit back and <laughs> listen to the response. <laughs> I, I, I think what you, what you said was very interesting. And um, I have a question for you. You said that faith is uncertainty. I, I wrote it down that you wrote that faith is uncertainty. And it always, always leaves something mm -hmm. unconcluded. Well, I don't want to say certainty or uncertainty because conviction is a form of certainty. Mm -hmm. Right. So, so I've, and you can be I, very I, convicted in your own with, soul. With, with that in mind, with the uncertainty of faith, um, in it, let's say thinking about this in terms of percent, a hundred percent, like a hundred percent is the greatest confidence, and zero percent is zero confidence. Yes. How confident are you? in the existence of God, because you, you said that faith, you because you have faith in God and that faith is uncertainty. How confident may I express in percentage are you of the existence of God? We are challenged with in our faith every day. I would say majority of my life, I would be always in the nineties. Nineties. Okay. That's, that's fair enough. Nineties. That's so there's a 10%. But I would like to give you a little hint here on that one, because we as Christians, Bible-loving Christians, from the word of the Bible, we believe that God, we are creating our heart as the sanctuary of the temple of God. This body becomes the temple of God. Mm -hmm. Well, actually, I would say throughout my life, I have been um, in general in the 90s. The more I involve myself and um, allow God into my life, the, the closer to it gets to 100. And the only reason why I don't say 100, because I would immediately remove the, remove the element of um, renewal there. I, I, I would not say that I am... 100% convinced in the ex mm -hmm. existence of God That's because and, my faith and, wouldn't have to be renewed every day and, and I would shut the doors to life. And that shows that you're a thinking person and you 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 evaluate things and you observe them and that's that's fair enough. I'm you know when somebody says 100 I kind of mm, you it's know fanatic. I I refrain and, from being fanatical. I, I and I greatly respect you for that. I have a I have another question. Um if well let me see um if you let's just say for this is a hypothetical question something happened and one day you like tomorrow for whatever reason again this is not going to happen i know it's not going to happen but let's say for just tomorrow you decided i don't believe in god mm -hmm. I, this that was your decision would your life change and how would it change? Yes, it would. Would it, would you be a better? And I would. I'm gonna let me. I'm gonna be more specific. Yes. Would you be a better person? 
you know, in your in your actions every day, or would you be a worse person? How would it, it, I wouldn't even say it that way. I would feel destroyed. Mm -hmm. I would immediately feel but, destroyed. But but this is let me let me let me backtrack that. You have to really believe, like if if you know, the question I'm asking is this hypothetical question. Again, I don't think this is ever going to happen to you. But mm -hmm. if you one day you decided, I don't believe in God, you wouldn't be destroyed because that's your decision that you, because, because, because that is that, that day, that is your truth. In other words, you have to really believe that there is no God on that day. I don't know what I would want to live for then. I mean, the, the, the existence of the heavenly kingdom so, so, and that I will be living in, in, in an infinite love for others and my creator God is the very essence of my life. Do, do you ever wonder, by the way, do you ever wonder what people who don't believe in God live for? Do you ever? Wonder? Yes. Yes. Because I am not born Christian. I am mm -hmm. a born again Christian. Excellent. So, so you wonder, so, so would you care to ask somebody who doesn't believe in God, what that person lives for? I would uh, love to follow up with that task, but it hasn't occurred to me so much before. Even though I live with an atheist and I've been working on his 76-year-old, basically scientist, mm -hmm. he's my roommate, and I have been working on his faith for like five, six years, and he finds it extremely entertaining. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, and at times I do too, because I can sometimes... I find you extremely entertaining, by the way, and I've only been talking to you for five minutes. So, Maya, I would love to continue this conversation. However, I, I was actually scrolling down my grocery list. I need to get to the grocery store because I'm my, my cupboard is bare and my dog uh, needs to be fed. And so, yes, I let you go. But I can tell you this. I have been grown up in Hungary in a commun uh, socialist country. Mm -hmm. Never met God. I grew up in an 80s family and environment until age 22, even though I, it, between 19 and 22, I entertained the thoughts of God and the existence of God. And after thorough examination, I decided that it, it totally devastated my fa father. But I do know what, uh, in that sense what atheists live for. And I wouldn't want to go back. Well, I, I, I must commend you, though, for being very open minded. And uh, and I'm sure that please. Are, are you new to Blab, by the way, or is this? Yeah, it has been my first week, but I'm here every day at two o'clock. Excellent. You know, oh, my there, there there are some Blab. If you see some Blabs, especially toward the, the top rows, the top two rows where it says something like, oh, atheist hangout or atheist chilling. Um, some friends of mine go in there, and these are the nicest guys. They're they're atheists, but we welcome people like you to come in there and talk. And because and everybody gets along the way I get along with you, just famously. I would, <laughs> exactly. So I would love to see you come in there. Oh, I find it extremely fascinating. Yeah. I it it make my father has passed away, and um. It feels like to me it's basically it brings him talking about these atheists or scientific point of views feels like a little bit wrestling with him. <laughs> That's okay. That's okay. Hey, uh, but anyway, Maya, I do have to. I do have to go. Um, I'm sure somebody else can come into the uh, channel. Yes. And Thank you very much. It was a pleasure to have you. Take care. Bye bye. Bye bye. So, let's see if we have. Whom do we have here? Young idealists, idealists followed you on blub. Okay, but who else do I see here? Any questions? Glenn Underwood. Does a, it, that doesn't represent atheism for any everyone. Um, I don't know too much about the different branches of atheism, but... Um, I would be glad to talk about it. It is a new idea to me. <laughs> there we go. Um, I am David Woguan. Welcome. Welcome, everybody. I love to have you here. You need to present me with some questions or come up and continue the discussion with me. 
Michael Dove, how do we determine if your particular Christian religion is the right one compared to, say, Mormon or Hindi? I don't really care about determining the different um, uh, denominations. They distinguish themselves. I do not distinguish myself by distinguishing others. Um, I personally um, am interested in the truth. So I research the truth in every single way I possibly can. And I am not... Um, I'm not interested of defining other people. I'm interested of defining myself. And if I am searching the truth, that defines me. And um, truth is my religion. I have, I, I have no uh, any particular agenda to prove anybody wrong. I just enjoy the journey. How can we determine which is true? Um, which, 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 which denomination is true? Michael, would you like to come up here and, um, and discuss it with me? It's really hard from these small little short sentences to define what somebody is referring to. But how can you determine which denomination is true? That is a huge topic. I would be open to discuss it if you come up, but if you don't, I'm just going to have to let it go because it is too big of a topic for me to go into a monologue here. Um, but um, shortly, if a denomination teaches the truth, I will go along with it as long as until they prove it otherwise. I don't believe that any, deter any denomination um, is, um, how, would, how could I say, um, that we have denominations in this world is basically not the, is, is God's work against Satan. If, if there was no Satan in this world, God would have one unified truth available for us. But Satan, in as many ways as he possibly can, divides people from each other and their convictions, giving, uh, allowing them only a portion of the truth. Why? Because if we were unified in one truth, he would have, we would be so powerful that he would have not a chance against the human race. By, by using the weakness of the human condition of we are only able to see in part since sin, and I believe even Adam and Eve had only been able to see in part, otherwise they would not have been deceived. He uses that the weakness of the human condition that we are only able to see in part, and he divides, he interrupts, he breaks it into pieces, what we call truth, so that nobody would have the complete truth all on its own. Therefore, we all have to seek it. But the truth is, and the, <laughs> and the um, interesting thing is, that God didn't leave us totally lost. He has given us our word, his word, the Bible, to refer to whenever we have a question. And he also sent his own Holy Spirit to serve us a guidance and an inspiration. If we want to find out the answer to some sort of dilemma or question, we can also pray about it, meditate it, and search the Bible for truth, for God's given truth and answer, listening to God's voice through the filter of his Bible, not just sitting in meditation and whatever thoughts come into your mind, but tested and tried against the words of the Bible, the truth can be defined to any question. We just need to, um, we have so many questions we don't know the answer to, it's because we haven't discovered it in the Bible yet. Thank you very much, Michael, for the question. 
Let's see who else has something here. Glenn Underwood. Is it possible the holy book isn't specific enough and has room for interpretation? Yes. The Bible is being interpreted in all different kinds of directions depending what mind is reading it, which is why we always have to pray to the Holy Spirit for wisdom and guidance. I highly recommend to try it. Okay. Versus being Satan. I don't know what that part, Glenn, is um, referring to your partial sentence of versus versus being Satan. I don't know what that means. Can you please write a little more on that sentence and question? Thank you. Steve, if a person is sincerely convinced, oh, we have already discussed that question about an hour ago. Oh, goodness, we have been on air almost two hours. I barely even noticed it. Anybody else is interested to come and be on air with me? Steve. All right. Welcome back, Steve. I have allowed you into the room, so you should be showing up in a minute. Hi. Hello. Thank you for being here again. No problem. Um, if you don't mind, I'm on my way home and I'm going to take the public transit system. So if that's okay, yes, or if that okay. causes any complications, feel free to, to close me out. I won't mind. Well, the only thing would disturb this conversation if we couldn't hear you. The site right. we don't need to worry about. Now you look very nice on the screen, but that doesn't, wouldn't stop us from co conversing. Um, okay. And if, if I can't hear you, I will let you know. Okay? Okay, cool. And then, um, so I'm curious about having a conversation um, regarding what you believe. And there were some interesting points that came up. Um, you mentioned that you don't think that you could find a purpose in life based on, or if, if you happen to be atheist. Was that what you said? Yes, I, I would say that until age 20, I was an atheist too, and I debated. I was undecided until 22, and I basically would not go back to my old self. That's my emotion about it. Oh, okay, okay. But say, hypothetically, if you could be convinced that at least the Christian God was not true... But at the same time, you felt like you had a much better outlook on life than you did back then. Would that would that be perhaps preferable? Or would, would that seem more reasonable to you? You mean you mean that um, the Christian God would not fulfill my heart anymore, but I would be on a search for a different kind of deity? Is that? I'm not well, no, sure I'm, if I've got you. I'm, I'm just sort of asking where, where you feel you would be coming from in terms of purpose. Like, I, I can't give you a purpose. My purpose in life is very clear to me, is, is to grow God's kingdom in the hearts of people. Because okay. heaven, the word heaven means the dwelling place of God. Wherever God dwells, it is heaven or his kingdom we christians okay. according to the bible eventually reach a certain point in our lives when we understand that our body is a temple an empty temple and our heart is a sanctuary an empty sanctuary for god to dwell in it and that's why we feed it with god's word for him to have a way to dwell in there it is like a thirst or a hunger now, if I suddenly God would leave my heart and my body and I was here as an empty shell, as, as an empty temple for any kind of different ideas to enter and how could I possibly exist without that purpose? I, I am already living in heaven, but I would say heaven is in me. I see. So... I myself am atheist. I consider myself atheist. 
do you mean to say that only you yourself would not feel like you have purpose anymore in life if you were atheist? Or would you also believe that it's, or, or find it hard to understand that an atheist like myself can okay, feel I would that like to, I would like to tell you, uh, my experience is very different than just, I hate to use the word theory, but it is not just a bunch of ideas. I have grown up in an atheist family where depression was the primary emotion. I also grew up in, a, in an atheist family with a majority of patriarchs have died by suicide, including my father. And when I have been throughout his suffering and has seen what he had gone through, battling against um, spirit and battling against the fact that what I believe and I'm convinced that is because he not believed that there was somebody loving out there who created him and cared about him and would guide his life without that faith. He could find no purpose. I am turning 42 this year. That was the very year when my father took his own life. So mm. my experience goes way beyond. God has given me experiences throughout my journey that cannot be described just by ideas and by theory. They are experiences. Okay. So, but can I, can I ask um, if your experience had been... The exact same thing, except that your family and your father um, were Christian. Would you then believe the opposite to be true? That would there I was some emotionally would problematic. I be an even with, yeah. if I had the same experiences I have had, would I be an atheist? Would I choose to be an atheist? Right. Um, well, I, I wouldn't go so far as would that make your final decision. I just mean to ask, would you find that to be evidence of the opposite being true, that people's hearts were more cold because they were Christian? Most religions agree on one thing about God, is that God is love. I, as a woman, intuitively go where love is. I want to seek love. That's how women in my family never commit suicide. That's, that's the example I have in front of me. But in the whole right, world, right. Uh, what, is, what makes more sense to go toward than the light and love? Everything else that you're walking towards is either rejection, hatred, or results in death. I intuitively, in my heart, seek out love. So why would I choose to debate love? Um, I, I, I think I understand what you're describing, but I, I'm not too sure if I understand, because I don't, it doesn't sound like you're, you're answering the, the question I asked. If I exactly. had the same experience in my life as I had, right. is there any chance that I have cho would have chosen to be an atheist? No, no, that's not my question. Okay, my question then sorry, is, I misunderstood you. you. Had, I would like if you had the same experiences except for one detail, these people in your life that had uh, committed suicide, that, that were depressed, were actually Christian, would you see that as evidence that Christianity affected them emotionally and negatively? In the same way that you see atheism to have affected them emotionally and negatively. Ooh, this is a little bit over my head. I don't, I'm, I don't, I'm not sure I can put together the beginning of the sentence and the end of the sentence. <laughs> Let's recap. I want to be able to hear and answer your question. I'm just not really connecting the dots. So, so if you saw, you, you saw your father um, die of suicide, and you believe it had something to do with his atheism. That's what you said, correct? Well, I have witnessed his suffering for, in an in experiences that could have been easily answered and comforted by the word of the Bible or the knowledge of having an ultimate creator and a loving creator who loves him. If he would have experienced that 
infinite love and would have been convinced enough about its existence, he probably would have been a lot happier person and would not have taken his own life. Okay, but if he had died a Christian in the same way, would you attribute that Christianity ah, in the same way? You want to know what? whether I am rejecting atheism or I don't put in it because, because that was my original starting point and it disillusioned me. Now, if I had been a Christian growing up and my father was a Christian, and at age 22, I would have mm. seen him to commit suicide. Would it have made me an atheist? Mm. Because I would start denying no, God. That's not my question. That's still not your question. My question isn't, would you be an atheist? Okay. My question is, would you have Okay, I can't hear you. I, you have been cutting out so much that I am losing most of your sentence. Oh, sorry. Um if your father had died of suicide as a christian would you have thought christianity had something to do with why he killed himself what if i would blame god for it right ruby no, ruby no, i will let you in right after we answer these questions i will let you in ruby right after we finished working with this question all right so okay um if i still didn't get you steve can you please try again? <laughs> okay. Would I blame if God? If your father had died of suicide, not would you blame God? Would you have thought it Christianity to be the cause? Christianity specifically. Not any God, not, uh, or, or even, um, you know, in the general sense of, of a God that exists his possibly at all or i my mean very here you are assuming that my father was a christian or i was a christian and would it change my life hypothetically i'm, I'm hypothetically, saying hypothetically my father was a christian and hypothetically i was a christian and in hands of his suicide all of a sudden i would start uh denying christianity would i blame christianity for it yes, yes blame Christianity. well i tell you what yeah. i make a big distinguish distinguishing between christianity and god because christianity is nothing else but an interpretation of god just because i call myself christian because i'm a follower of christ doesn't mean that i approve of the entire um available um array of different denominations and interpretations of what that word means you say the word jesus and there is like three four thousand different interpretation of the word jesus around the world there are many christians who don't even base their knowledge in bible they don't even read the bible and they call themselves christian it totally blows my mind it, it personally that really pushes my button because then why do you call yourself um a christian if you don't love the word of god but that is technical would i blame christianity for it maybe because christianity is nothing else but um uh, what is it called um um incomplete interpretation of what god is there is um, many churches with different belief systems and none of them is entirely covers the truth the truth is that we are all seeking truth and I'm seeking truth. And I choose to call it Christianity because I have came to define Christianity for myself by I hear Jesus' teaching and the way I interpret it, I call myself a follower of Jesus. And that's what so, makes so me it Christian. The church next door or the other church next door or the church behind my house, I'm surrounded by churches. And I even have a university that, te that is primarily teaches Christianity and faith. None of them defines my Christianity, not because I want to debate them or question their sincerity, but because by my belief in this existence on the, in this world where Satan is the ruler, Satan have done absolutely everything within his power 
to confuse and divide the truth. And okay, so Maya, not, I just... not a single organization or system or written piece of paper that entirely conveys and covers the truth. Right. But I do believe Maya. that God's Bible is protected by God himself. Thank you. My, I, you just, can... I just want to point out, <laughs> I, I understand and I appreciate your response. I, I just want to um, point out, and this is not to offend you or insult you, just to point out um, things that, like people in general, we have biases, mm -hmm. right? And if you want to be honest with yourself, it, the best way to do that, one, one important thing to keep, to be aware of is where your own bias can interfere with how you investigate the truth. Why? So you know how you could, be, could be convinced about Mary. my personal bias or not bias? If you would no, no, be... I just want to point out, if I, can, if I can just point out where the bias is. Is my father's you, suicide experience. You're, you, didn't, you, you went and thought of um, atheism as being a partial cause of your father's suicide. But if the role was reversed and he wasn't an atheist, he was something else. He was a Christian specifically, as you are a Christian now. Well, then you wouldn't attribute it to Christianity. You wouldn't attribute it to the belief or the general belief that you hold in Christianity. And yet the same piece of evidence applies when it's an atheist. Okay, I would like to tell you here. If you were in my place, by the facts that you have I shared with you. Would you want to choose a faith and a religion or a God that primarily says that suicide is a sin and you will never see your father in heaven again? He's condemned and doomed for hell, like the Catholics do believe in that. Would you want to choose a faith like that? Would I want to choose a because faith? Because that has debated me on choosing Christianity for a long time. That was the only place where I felt that I would, I cannot believe this is a loving God. Because okay. That is, that I, is no. I, I understand that. But, um, Suicide is a, is, a, is a final sin. You cannot sin any bigger than that. What, what, does, what, what, what does that have to do with whether or not the claim is true? I cannot be biased about the choice of my faith when I have gone through the experience of um, accepting no, no, I'm, I'm not saying your that I never want to see biased. my father in heaven. I'm not saying that your overall decision was biased. To be Christian, I'm, I, can't, I can't say uh, that I know enough about your reasons to say that your overall decision was wholly biased. What I'm talking about is the piece of evidence that you pointed out. You saw the, the fact that your father was atheist and he went through that as evidence for something being wrong with atheism. That was not the only thing. That was not the only reason. I was already on the Christian walking toward the light of Christ. I was in the process. That was not the only my, reason why I became Christian. I understand that's not the only reason. I'm not saying it is. I'm saying that the reason why you think that uh, your father died was in part due to his atheism. But if he was a Christian, you would not see Christianity to be in part the reason why he died. No, I, that, would, that's the only I would blame the same person for his suicide, even if he was an atheist or a Christian. Is the, that person is called Satan. He had a wide door open to, to have access to my father's mind as an atheist. If he would have been a Christian, he would have a much, much more narrow gate, but it is still Satan's doing. Okay. So then what you're saying is that there is no belief which your father could have had, which you would not attribute to showing problems in your current belief. There is, I'll say that again, I think I almost got you. There is no there's, there's belief which your father could have hypothetically had, which would have put you to questioning, due to his death, questioning your current belief. No, I have grown up in a scientist home. 
I examined every emotion and every thought that I have allowed into my mind. I am pretty independent thinker. I don't believe that my thought, and I tried to prove that for you. I have examined. Um, it, but I need to go and something. I have examined the fact that um, if I accept Christianity, if I accept the Christian truth or the existence of God truth, there are great chances of I will never see my father again in heaven. And I have bottled that for a very long time, that emotion that in my opinion, I cannot say that certainty because I have no knowledge of that what happens after death. But whether if I'm going to see him again or not to see him again, it cannot, it cannot take away from me the determination of knowing the truth and to know that truth can only come from God. Thank you very much. Hey, precious gem. Oops. I am not sure what you, woman, he's gone. Okay, I'm not sure what Precious is referring to. I think I was out of the conversation. Confirmation bias works in small step. I am getting upset. Christians don't take responsibility for their actions. Every bad thing they do is attributed to Satan. I don't agree. Christians are very strongly called upon for the circum consequences of their actions. Extremely strongly um, which is why the world is improving, basically. Since there is Christianity, we slowly progressing into the direction of being better human beings. Um, yes, finally. <laughs> Hi. Hi. Hey. Hi, precious. I am not entirely sure where in the conversation you popped in and um, what parts you wanted to contribute, but you are welcome here and lead me up to what is it that, why are you here on air? What, what, did you, what is it that made you want to come here and converse with me? Well, actually, I was trying to help you answer that question to the guy. You actually weren't really answering it correctly. So I was trying to help you, but you just told me to wait and kept me waiting. Oh, yeah. Oh, I see. <laughs> um, I, the thing is that it, it has, I have really tried to understand him. And it, it had taken forever to, for me to understand his question. What he was trying to say was, if you were raised in a Christian household, you were raised yeah. in a Christian church, whether it's non-denominational, Baptist, Pentecostal, whatever you are. Mm -hmm. And your father, as a Christian man, committed suicide, not as an atheist, as a Christian man committed suicide, would you question your faith in God? And I probably would. And I would have gone through the exact experience as I did when I have been um, wondering whether if I want to be part of a world philosophy or a religion that is actually going to shun my father's soul from heaven. That was a huge crisis for me. Yeah, I, I bet it was. I, I've, I've lost the mother. i not like that, but um, you know, my response to that would have been because I'm a Pentecostal Christian. My response to that would have been, I never question my faith, no matter how bad things get, because that's what the devil wants to do is rob you of your joy, rob you of your faith. Because in John ten ten, like I was saying. It says the thief's purpose is to come to kill, steal, and destroy. Yes. So your father, as an, as an atheist, was living a life of sin, and the wages of sin is death. So right there, he let the devil take dominion over him because the devil had dominion over him, and that's why he took his life. Um, if a Christian man were to take his life, then he... My guess is he probably didn't know God because once you become a child of God, now you have dominion over the devil. The Bible says all you have to do is resist the devil because Jesus 
beat his butt over 2,000 years ago. We don't have to struggle with the devil. We have to resist them. And if you're struggling and he's taking dominion over you, you need to get checked out on what you're doing wrong. So if I, I don't, my family's not Christian, at least not all of them. If my father was a Christian man and he committed suicide right now, I'd question my father about it. I wouldn't question God. Like, God, why'd you let this happen? I'd yeah, say, Dad, where see, was your faith? You see, precious, what um, I see here from my understanding from the Bible is the temptation is not sin. What we do with temptation is to entertain a thought is not the same as to accept it. I can entertain thoughts of different thinking because that's what means to be open-minded. But to accept it and to allow that thought to take a nest in my head, that would be sin. The thing is, um, temptation is not a sin. Falling into it is. You're right on that part. Um, and every time you're tempted, God find, God gives you a way out, which is also scripture. Which is but, why we should search his but, word. But when you... You can't entertain every thought that comes to your mind, especially if it comes to the devil. You can't entertain the devil. You have to rebuke him and get out. That's why when we accept Christ into mm -hmm. our hearts, in the Bible it says we need to renew our minds. We can't renew our minds if we're entertaining wicked thoughts. We need to have our mind fully in Christ and give our and ask God to give that us is the mind the of Christ. That is the privilege of a mature Christian. But if you have become Christian at 22 and your father um, uh, half a year later commits suicide, you are not mature in your faith enough to actually know that to that extent as you are describing. I was very young then and even younger as a Christian. And I was examining all those thoughts and I have overcome both through um, intuitively and through the word of God in unison. But that's the thing, though. Um, I'm 21. I've only been saved a year. I've been through a lot. And even being saved for a year, I've been through a lot and seen a lot. The thing is, you can't let your faith shake. If you have absolute trust in God, like absolute trust, and you know his Are word. Are you trying you to support me here or to prove that I am not a good enough Christian? No, I'm not saying anything about you not being a good enough Christian. I'm just trying to get the truth out to you that you that you need to understand. Yeah, thank you. Yes, it is totally, I totally agree with you. When you, as soon as you recognize Satan and that it is a temptation, you have to uh, uh, command him to get behind you. Yeah. Very often, but Satan is very intelligent. He knows exactly where your weak points are and where to approach you with thoughts that you don't recognize as temptation and that's his thoughts right away. You have to examine them and compare it and hold it against the word of God and study. And while you do that, it's called a process. But when you are done and you have found your answer in the word of God, then you immediately want to tell him to get behind me, Satan. But unless you recognize that this is temptation and it is the works of Satan and not of God, that it is not match the word of the Bible, until then you got to examine it. God very often in the Bible mentions it, gives you an advice just like with tithing, that this is what you should do. But test me on this and I will prove you that your faith is good. Test me on this. God wants us to test him so that we would grow in faith. That's exactly what he does for us too. He's testing us so that he would see how we grow in faith. It's called intimacy. When intimacy literally, word by word means is to, to be with somebody whom you do not reject in any way not any single way to be intimate with god means you don't reject him in any way you cannot find a way of rejecting him nor god can reject you in any way possible it's called intimacy that's a relationship that is 
reserved for people who have searched the word of God and have lived with him in relationship long enough to be called mature Christians. Now, if for you it has happened after a year that you have grown into that conviction and you are, uh, you are, you, you would know exactly, then you are very lucky you had the right mentors. But maybe your faith is going to be tested some other way. And everybody, oh, my, everybody, my faith has been, my faith has been tested repeatedly, yes. not all, but especially through the devil. It's, um, you it, know, it is but, always like that. I want to tell you, that means God loves you and he wants to grow closer to you because by testing and overcoming is your intimacy with him grows. And the thing is, God loves you too. And the, when it comes to this faith thing, you have to realize the authority you have as a child of God over the devil. That's yes. what you have to realize. If you don't know your authority over the devil, you're not going to pass. You know what I mean? I agree. <clears throat> and if I understand you, you would never change your mind about Christianity, regardless of any argument or evidence of, yes, it is honest to say that you want to believe what is true. No, God, okay, I will never change my mind. I'm answering one of the comments, questions. No, I will never change my mind because of everything I've been through. And I've experienced the love of God. I've experienced what God has done for me. And I've seen the truth. And, you know, um, sometimes even people try to throw science at me. Like, um, I remember this one guy, I was on Periscope. He tells me that the Bible, I think in Matthew something says, um, that the moon will be darkened like in the end of times and he wants to argue with me telling me scientifically it says that the moon doesn't have its own light that it um reflects off the sun and i read the i opened my bible i read the bible verse and i was like dude if you read the verse before it it says the sun will give no light and the moon will be darkened or vice versa something like that like the light part if the sun is darkened and the moon gives no light then the moon has nothing to reflect on if the sun is darkened. So you see, science, it, um, it agrees with the Bible in some things, and then at other points, it wants to contradict it. Well, science, um, originally what God had created, and God's methods are science. It is just in this universe, on this earth, where Satan is the prince. It is misconstrued, corrupted, just enough, just enough, to serve his purposes, Satan's purposes. But it doesn't mean Satan did not invent anything. Satan didn't bring anything new or created anything new. Satan just takes what God has created, what is God, and misconstrues it, corrupts it enough that it would not be perfect anymore and would not belong in the dominion of God. Now, what you said earlier, I would like to collaborate with it, God works one heart at a time. It's a personal relationship. It is um, what you are experiencing that God is testing you is, is because he wants to grow in faith with you. Not only that he wants to grow your character, because that is true, improve your character. He wants to grow in intimacy with you. But by testing you, he, not only you are growing in faith with God, but God is able to invest more into you because you have proven yourself to be a good steward of his trust and talents, and he can entrust you with more. Mm -hmm. um, I'm sorry. I'm just reading the comments. Um, how... How do you know God created science? Well, God created everything in the world. Um, I honestly can say that I, in my own way, I never in my life has said God created science. If anything, I was kind of against science. Um, I'm not too sure about that. I'm really not. I would assume God created everything. I, I would assume that he gave knowledge to people like he gave knowledge to doctors and stuff like that he gave knowledge to scientists to go with the bible but then just like almost every other thing and got corrupt or something i don't know i honestly don't even know too much about science period like the only way i can know about science is if somebody brings something up to me 
and I'll either look through it in the Bible or, or like, you know, get into it so I can give you a, an answer. Um, um, Michael, Michael does, am, sorry, sorry, just a moment, because I don't know how to send personal messages on Blub. And Michael Dove has been waiting for his answer for a very long time now. Earlier, what's, his answer, what's his question? Just a moment is a question for me. Earlier, when you said you have 90% confidence in your belief, what reasons make you 10% doubt? It is my caution, sir, to be very cautious not to be a fanatic. God is not interested in fanaticism and fanatics. I take a good caution and leave room for God to prove his existence in my life and increase my faith every day. I leave room for God to bring new things into my life and open my mind up to it. If I but, would not leave that 10% empty open, I would consider myself a fanatic. And I am not interested to dwell in that kind of, God is not, approve, not approving fanaticism. The thing about that, um, if I may say, um, when you accept Christ into your heart and you give your life to him, you need to give him your all. I mean, your 100%. Yeah. Just because, just because when you doubt, that is actually not a very good thing. Well, that 10% you... is not a doubt. It is a room for God to do his miracles and work his ways in my life. Yeah, no, definitely. But it's just like, the thing is, God doesn't need. Yes, he does. When you give your, he when you give me, your... He, he instructs me to test him so that he could prove himself right. He does yeah. not ask me. He actually, several places in the Bible, instructs his believers and his people not to fall for fanaticism. That's not the same that having giving him his, his your all. If that's how you choose to believe, is your choice. No, but I know. I but the thing choose, is... I choose... To leave room for God to do his miracles, ask his questions, do his tests with me. And I do that out of love. Just as I have been given free will because God has given me free will, I give him the same honor and I give him free will. I'm sorry. Give me one second. I am David. Um your comments is also God does not require defending him. You ask someone to prove God. You, you know, you know, Ruby, you God. don't have to be the coordinator of this interview or a conversation. You were invited here. I would like you to right. know that it is still my blob. Really, Thank really you're quick. Getting a, yeah. I just want to. Yes, I, I, because I, I'm I don't sorry. like. I don't like how you take control of uh, take control of the conversation by reading the side notes and. Then it, it, I I would really respect it if you are in my house, you know that that it is still mine. But here's the thing: what I want to say about that, real quick. And I'm sorry, Steve. Give me one second. You're he, the the word instructs us. Jesus tells us to go out into all the world and speak the gospel to all creations. These people are asking for answers. This is your chance to minister to them. And if you're not going to minister to them, then I am. Unless you kick me out. You're you're kind what, of what, trying to what, debate. What, I don't get your point. Can you please say that again? Because I'm, I'm not getting where you're coming from. You believe okay. that I am not ministering well enough to my people, to the people of listeners? I didn't because say you're I'm not open minded. No, I didn't say you're not ministering well enough. I'm saying that you're... Yes, you can be focused on the other people on this chat, that you can see our faces and talk and answer questions or whatever. But you also have to realize that there's people asking questions that are not part of this, that want to know in the comments. And you and I can go back and forth debating and debating, but what does that help anybody else? Anybody is very welcome to, to tell me that they would like to be here and I will let them in. The thing is that there is not a chance that I'm going to be able to read all of the notes and questions that are coming up here, especially while I'm talking. But I still would like to maintain the integrity of this conversation that we have one, com one comprehensive th 
thought at a time. All those people right there who are commenting, they're not, not unimportant. They have the choice to be a background noise or to come up and make their voices heard. Thank you. Their voice? Um, hi, Steve, Jane, hi, can I just ask? I'm sorry, I, my phone had to re be restarted because uh, I was like, I was being disconnected from everything and couldn't hear your answers. Um, could, uh -huh. could you tell me what, what your response was again um, to my last question? Uh, what was your last see... question, dear? Me? I don't remember. Um, so again, the question was addressed to me. Thank you. Are, are you Steve, saying, what was your... Yes. Are you saying that no amount of evidence or and no argument would be sufficient enough for you to change your mind in regards to your beliefs? I believe there is very little chance for that. I don't like to talk in absolutes okay. because I don't know what experience I should have been missing in order to remain an atheist. But there is an extremely small chances of that, that if I have gone through the same experiences of life, and I, that I would be biased at choosing Christianity or choosing Jesus Christ and his Bible, oh, Bible and the God who stands behind it. I'm talking about you right now. Yes. Would, you're, are you saying that no amount of argument and no amount of evidence would be sufficient or even taken into uh, uh, reasonable consideration for you to change your mind about Christianity? There is no reasonable amount of evidence for me to change my mind about Christianity? Is that what you said? Uh, hypothetically, if we were to have, uh, just, if, if I were to have a perfect argument and perfect evidence that should convince any reasonable per person that um, Christianity is false, would you look at that argument and look at the evidence and say, it doesn't matter how good it is, it doesn't matter if it's the most perfect evidence that ever was or ever could be. All, nothing would change your mind. Is that what you're saying? I would be willing to witness an argument like that because I'm curious and I care for the people who are um, part of that conviction. I would want to know in what ways could I be of assistance. But as of now... In this time of my life, I'm ter certainly convinced that there is absolutely no amount of evidence that could defer my faith from God. I would attribute the efforts to Satan, and I would tell him to get behind me. Okay, then I think it only stands to reason that, that your answer is uh, definitely no. Like, there, if, if your God did not exist, there would be no way for you to know that it, it didn't exist. And if there was plenty of evidence to show that it didn't exist, you would never accept that evidence. Well, I have already tackled that question because I said earlier that if, I, if there was an absolute objective scientific way to prove that God did not exist, that there was, okay. no, there was no room for faith. And faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen and it i i, I believe my understanding of that is that faith is the substance of the soul and the evidence of the soul if there is no substance to it and there is no evidence of the soul then it does not exist then you are a carnal human being in order to be have access to everlasting life and admittance into everlasting life you need to have a soul. Okay, I, am, so... I am not interested to throw my soul to Satan and tell him, here, devour it with your theories and ideas. I'm going to do exactly what the God, God's book and the word um, uh, instructs me and advises me, advises me to do, is to command the spirit of Satan and tell him to get behind me, not... Not even, okay. I'm not, wouldn't be entertaining Satan 
in my immediate belief. But I would have okay. to entertain it and I have to observe it because I don't, I don't care for Satan. I care for the people who are influenced by Satan. And I would want to minister to them. So then what, what I, I guess I don't understand um, uh, quite so much is if, so you would change your mind. Uh, are you saying you would change your mind if all gods could be disproven? I am saying there is no way anybody could prove absolutely that there is no God. And I say that with that? absolute conviction. Because uh, okay. if, there, if there was no doubt, if, if there was only certainty, there would be no faith. And there is no way that that feeling inside me, I call faith, is not existing. It has to exist somewhere. If I'm okay. capable of believing in something that I don't see and I don't hear, and you are capable of that too, you can believe in something that you don't see and don't hear because you can believe that one day you're going to have kids. If you can believe that, now it's what's happen, it will happen or not, but somewhere in part of you, you believe that you will have kids if, if that's what your wish is. Okay, wait, wait. So, so does my faith in the idea... Wait, wait. My, does my faith in the idea that I, I will have children someday affect the truth of whether or not I will have tr children someday? If you believe in something that does not exist at the moment, you are believing in something that is not um, provable and has that consequence is something that you cannot see, then you have faith. Then you have faith in your future children. And that faith would not exist if there was conviction. There was what, what, certainty. What does, that, what does that certainty, that faith, have to do with telling me what is true? Certainty and faith are not the same thing. Well, either way. What does no, no, that no, because faith... that exactly misses the point. If no, you have certainty you're proven... Them the same thing. But you're, 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 you're describing them in the same sentence. No, 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 no. I'm proving, I'm proving, I'm putting them next to each other to show you the difference. If science can prove certainty, then there is no faith. And if there is faith, then, then that is, which is actually the substance of no proof, then there is no certainty, surety. There can be conviction, but that is subjective. Objectively, Science can also provide you with facts and certainty. You would have to question certainty and have room for variables in order to have faith. You're saying that you have to be willing to, uh, are you saying that you have to be willing to doubt in order to have what you define as faith? I wouldn't use the word doubt. You have to be willing to surrender the ego's game of wanting to have certainty. Okay. Okay, I think I understand more. But, but what, I'm, what I'm asking is, if does, does your faith, as you define it, determine what is true? Does it tell you that something is true? Well, I would I would love to answer your question, but I wouldn't like to ignore Precious being on air. Is there anything you would like to say, Precious? Um, to be honest, I really I just started paying attention to this conversation because for a little bit I kind of got out of it. Um, I didn't understand Steve's question. Okay, so because my... I wasn't listening. Because I wasn't listening. My my question, Ruby, was essentially. Are you saying that there is no amount of evidence and no amount of, of um, argument or clear, rational, logical argument that could ever be sufficient enough to change your mind about Christianity being true? No, because of the simple fact of the experiences that I've had with God and of the testimonies 
that I've had and what I've seen other people have that it's just, it has to be supernatural. It's just like God said that there will be a lot of sign and wonders in life. It's a wonder when people sit there and you hear the testimonies or you're in a live audience and you see someone crippled, get up and walk. You just sit there and you're like, there's no way that science can prove this. I've seen, I've heard testimonies of people being healed of cancer, seizures, whatever. And they go to the doctor and the doctor can sit there and look at them and say, I don't understand what's going on. You don't have a bit of cancer in you. You're your seizures they're gone i don't know what's going on like they can't have a rational explanation yes. for why their sickness is okay. gone so, yes so, but science, if science wants- very, is very willing to ignore those miracles but i can okay. tell you mm-hmm. those miracles can occur when there is absolutely no outward proof of that miracle happening personal secret little miracles happening in the human heart and thinking that okay, has so, created just so, as much of healing as if it would have been a, somebody gets up and suddenly starts walking. And okay, science so Ruby, is very quick disregarding them as they even exist. All right, so Ruby, um, so if the, um, so, so even if I could show you a, a clear and reasonable explanation for those things. So it, hypothetically, hypothetically, if I had a means of showing you a clear and reasonable, more reasonable explanation for why those things happen that you witnessed, um, would that lower your confidence in the same amount that it... I tell you what, I have been intimidated like that hundreds of times and thousands of times and those intimidation opportunities those intimidation events in my life were nothing else but an opportunity to research and grow in my faith eventually eventually if you search the word of god hard enough you find an answer for any possible question that a human being can come up with. And the Holy Spirit is there to guide you. But if you don't experience, if you don't, you will, you will experience the Holy Spirit's guidance even if you don't believe in him. You just cannot attribute it to that phenomena that it is the Holy Spirit because you don't have, you don't name it that way. You My- don't believe in its presence so you disregard it. You consider it part of your being, which is what exactly the trickster of the ego. The ego right. wants to prove it to you that the presence of the Holy Spirit is not the Holy Spirit. It is just you thinking very intelligently. And Maya, I understand what, what you're once saying. in a while I get into a teaching and the intelligent things are just flowing out of me that way beyond my capacity. That cannot okay. possibly be me. I, I think I understand what you're saying, but so if somebody can be able to come to the conclusion that Christianity is true, if they look hard enough and they seek hard enough, is it not the same case that any other religion can make the same claim and produce the exact same result? No, I wouldn't say so. If as I, look I hard said, enough, as long, I said, there is only one made. truth. Steven, Steve, there is only one truth, and that truth in this universe of Satan's dominion is broken into a billion little pieces. People from all walks of religions and all walks of life find little bits and pieces of it, but nobody is given the whole and complete truth. If I may say, Maya, if I may just kind of adjust that answer a little bit. You said there is only one truth, which you are 100% correct about it. Yes. But that one truth is not Christianity, Muslim, whatever. That one truth is Jesus. Because Jesus said, I am the truth, the life, and the way. So that one truth is simply Jesus. Yes, I agree. But the teachings of Jesus are not completely understood, even by Christians. And there are people from other walks of life that discover truth. They just don't attribute it to Jesus. And I want, to save get... I want to save them too. And I want them to come to the acknowledgement that it is attributed to Jesus. My, so you say these things with a lot of confidence. 
But yes. my question is, how do you know? Because the Spirit of God is right here with me, inside me, because I have learned to experience and distinguish my ego from a spiritual inspiration. This is not confidence of Maya. It is the confidence of the Holy Spirit you are encountering. Wait, if it how do you was know me, that? If I, it was me, I would be clueless because I'm a limited, carnal person. All this Wait. that you encountered with me are by the he, inspiration of the Holy Spirit that I believe is right here, right now on this channel. But how do you know that? How do you know if, like, what if God is real? Because I am no, no. not fabricating oh, it. Steve, because I'm, I'm, I'm not, not fabricating it. it. I am not coming up with all this. I'm not fabricating it. I'm not the author of what comes out of my mouth. I'm not saying that I, you are. I am giving to it. I'm, I'm not saying giving. that you are fabricating anything. What I'm saying is, how can you be sure of your own senses to the level okay. of confidence that you have when you yourself admit that this is fake. Can you please be patient for one minute because I have answered your question. My, my <laughs> confidence is not my confidence. It is the confidence of the Holy Spirit you are talking to. And my How do you know conviction, that? and please wait, you ask the question, be patient to well, let me finish. And so my confidence is not my confidence. And how do I know it? Because anything that comes out of my mouth is too much way more intelligent than I am capable of fabricating. I didn't say you oh. accused me with fabrication. I said it is way beyond my intelligence. I am Do not you know how? it. I am giving all credit oh. to the Holy Spirit and glorify the God that way. There is no glory to man. Unless he gives the glory to God. If are you trying, Steve, are you trying to say that how do we know it's not just us? Exactly. Believing that or like, because okay, look at, let me look tell at you what. Religion. What makes your claims and your convictions and your passion for it different than somebody in a completely different? We can barely hear you, Steve. Because you are cutting out. Let me let me answer that real quick. Because no other God answers the prayers of their followers. Muhammad, I've Allah, whoever it is, they're dead. I, Muslims have said themselves, when we're sick, we accept it because Allah is not a healer. But my God is a healer. He will heal you and prove himself to you. But that, you get I what would, I'm trying would, to say I there? I say that's true, but it is not entirely. Because I have just seen and was reported to um, the healing of a Muslim two Muslim men who prayed for each other and they were challenging my God. God heals believers or not believers. But right that there. is also Ruth. true that the only God that heals is the only Answers. one God. Yes. Perfectly. Every, other, every other God is dead. And to be honest, Indeed. I've seen Muslims turn into Christians. Yes. Listen. And, and God does heal people who are she not... Did. She just made the claim that there are Islamists, people who are Islam who um, make the same claim about healing. And you said that the reason that you know Ruby is because you claim that the biblical God is the only God that ever claims to heal. So if no. the wait, God but, that heals is the, them is the same God that heals me. Um what I'm saying is there is only one source to healing. Doesn't matter your denomination and your religion. No, what I what I was trying to say, Steve, was that um, nice meeting you too. What I was trying to say was that how do I put it? Every other religion, everyone almost has a complaint against their God. I've heard of Muslims come, becoming into Christians because they say. My God doesn't do this for me. My God doesn't do that. My God doesn't even speak to me. There was this one Muslim who said he seen Christians praying and Christians prayed over him. And he said, I want to have that relationship with my God. Okay. So and wait, he sat wait, there wait. and tried. So wait, then if somebody had a complaint of the Christian God, would that lower your confidence? No, not at all. Because there are a lot of Christians that have complaints. There are Christians... For your confidence, then what does that have to do with your reasons and how you know? What? If it wouldn't lower your confidence to see somebody else 
saying that they had a complaint about the Christian God, then what does complaining about the about a person's God have anything to do with the reason why you yourself believe? Say that again. I'm so sorry. I you said that the reason that you you know Christian God to be true was because other people of other religions all had complaints about their gods. So if somebody had a complaint about the Christian God, would that lower your confidence? You said no. So if it would yeah. lower your confidence in the Christian God, then what does what does that say about you knowing based on the, the idea that you have that other people don't complain about or that other religions have gods that they complain about? Your justification. Because here, okay, 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 okay. Look at look at the two differences. I'm going to explain this real quick, as quickly as I can. Okay. In my beliefs, there's only one true God, which is our God. Okay, so here we go. Christians that have complaints about God don't really know God. Other religions that have complaints about their God, they say they know everything they know about God. They want, they have, they try to know Him. They try to have this close relationship with Him, and they can't because there's no one there to have a close relationship with unless you're doing it with. Okay, the God so, of the Jews with our God. Ruby, now you're entering into the idea that if you did see a Christian who complained about the Christian God, you would then make the conclusion that they are no they could not be a, a Christian. Which this is basically a no. no true Christian's fallacy. Because to you're not allowing for any means to refute what you are claiming to have as evidence. And if you don't have a- no, what I'm saying about people, what I'm saying, because this, it's not really a- there's Christians, there's Christians that are sick, that are dying, that are depressed, don't even have the joy of the Lord. I'm not saying they're like going to hell or anything. What I'm saying is that they need, first of all, the word says my people are destroyed from lack of knowledge. They need to get into the word and they need to believe that God is who he says he is. Okay, I'm not saying we- they're all good. They're going to. My real question was how do you know? How do you know when you make the claim that the Holy Spirit is what discerns the difference for you of Christianity being true or false? How is that a claim of knowledge? What do you really I, have in terms of being able to say that you honestly to know? Permission to speak. Um, what I would like to say here is, Steve, I love your. Um, uh, how do you care that not struggle but a kind of a struggle with this theme there is a part a story in the bible between jacob and an angel who who wrestle each other all night long until the angel it, J- jacob is demanding the angel to bless him and basically you remind me of him right now you are jacob who is wrestling with an angel and is demanding to be blessed What I can tell you here as a final word, and because I have been on air for three hours now, I probably going to soon have to conclude this. I kind of getting weary here. That the relationship, God converts heart one by one. I cannot convey you the inner experience of a changed heart more than, um, what could I say? Um, You have heard of, Dr. Emoto, right, who blesses the water and it changes into more harmonious molecules and crystals of water crystals than um, they were before. The imperfect water crystals become perfect by blessing the water. The same thing I can tell you. I cannot convey you more unless you take the microscope and little photographic equipment that is going to change whether if my the molecules of my being have changed. You can't see it through your eyes, but my soul has changed. I have actually acquired a soul because I allowed God into my life. Now, it is a personal experience that waits for you. When you, I was you, still only a half-day Christian before I have completely given my life to God, I felt left out. I have even argued with God. I have blamed God for not wanting me. That come into my life and leave no doubt in my life. 
and I was angry with him that he does not change my heart. He still left me a half believer. And I had to go through that same battle, demanding God. And eventually, you know, if you ask, the Bible says, if you knock, the door will be opened. Ask and it will be given. But he didn't mean ca- didn't mean cars and vegetable gardens. I understand. He meant faith and soul. If you ask for your soul, it will be given. I understand. Yes. My, my, I used to be a Christian. Oh, and I used God to have faith you. in the Christian God, and I used to have a very strong conviction that and all of the claims strange. of the Bible were true. I've come to no longer believe that because of the evidence that I've seen, which shows. So, so you have been tested be and you went the other and, way because you failed to test God. God demands us to test Him on His going to come through to us. This is called faith. I'm so sorry. I don't, I don't pity you. I'm not no, going to pity no, my, you. I'm going to embrace this, it. I, I, no, I, what I, happened here is that we can't hear you, Steve. I've, I'm sorry. I've, we can tell that you are speaking, but we oh. can't understand the word you are saying. Um, yeah. Steve, I believe that. Hold on, I'm sorry. Um, ah, oh, he's enabled. I don't know what that means. This is my first time being on a blab i've been on it for a little bit but never like on live or whatever um what does it mean when it says call collins enabled he will try and come back in okay when he comes back in i might Um, i would like to address here a question that jonathan Kiss addresses me with in a private chat box. He says that the water example has thoroughly been debunked. Um, Jonathan, I am not claiming that if you look at a, um, um, a Christian under a microscope, you're going to see differences on on um, on that structure of water molecules, or you're going to see the crystallized uh, human being, the carnal being to be um, different. Why? Because Jesus did not save the carnal human human being. He saved our souls on the cross. His body has been tortured and um, and um, um, He was was the perfect sacrifice. Yes, it has been sacrificed. The carnal human being has been sacrificed. It has been set aside. Salvation is about the birth of the soul. You cannot prove the existence of the soul, or maybe some scientists will come and prove it to me that they, they can see the soul and show it in kind of heat pictures or something. But the um, problem is that there is no microscope that actually can prove the substance of the soul. So just the fact that somebody has a soul and not a ghost, not a ghost of any demon that might live in there, but of the substance of soul, if those instruments one day will be um, developed and will be shown to me, that will only mean one thing. There is no need for faith, which is the very substance of the soul and faith that is the very evidence of soul. Therefore, it would be like a vicious circle proving that it cannot be proven. God would never allow something like that to happen because he cares too much about our salvation and about his people. That's my standpoint today. And if 20 years from now, you will come up with some different scientific evidences, I will be open-minded, but I don't promise that I'm going to change anything of my convictions over that. Go uh, ahead, Maya, have, Can I please answer one of these girls' questions? Yes. I think it's a girl. She said... I'm, I'm going to answer real quick. She said, God sent his son to kill himself for us. What a disgusting to, to, thing to do. Hmm. We see Abraham would have done the same too. God is very capricious. Let, all right, let me tell you something. First of all, the Bible says that um, 
God, oh, God so loved the world, he sent his one, he sent his one, his only son. If you notice back in the Old Testament, they were always uh, sacrificing animals to be cleansed because of all the sin, how wicked they were, how all the sin that they were covered with. So Jesus, which is God, came from the high as crying baby. So he can, as us, not as he wasn't born with Adam's first sin because he wasn't born of man. So his blood was the perfect sacrifice to cleanse us all forever. That's why he did that. He did, And in the end, if you see right now, Jesus didn't die with all the sin and stood in hell. Jesus is at the right hand of the throne of God right now. And he did it for us. And I'll tell you, Jesus is not regretful of it. As of Abraham, if you can see, that was a test of faith for Abraham. Abraham was willing to follow God through everything and and obey all his commands. God was not going to let him kill his son, but God wanted to see if Abraham would go through with his word when Abraham says, I will follow you, whatever the case may be. So when Abraham took his son up to kill him, he went to kill him with complete faith and trust. And like, you know what? My God said this, I'm going to do this. But what happened? No, he told him, stop, don't do it. And then he provided a, a what is it called? A ram for him to sacrifice. Mm-hmm. God wasn't going to let him do such a thing. Yeah. But Jesus, he did it because of his love. Because if someone, no, I'm sorry, but if someone does not love us, they're not going to lay down their life for us. There is no one out here that's going to look at us and say, I hate this person. They're so mean, but I'm going to kill myself for them or I'm going to die. And you know what? Yeah, there. I'm sorry. I was going to say Jesus was not killed. He laid his life down. Mm-hmm. and he and the spirit raised jesus from the dead and that spirit that raised him from the dead lives inside of me now let me answer it also here shortly abraham was tested and he did not fail he stood the test of obedience to god and mm-hmm. god did not require him to follow through with the act now, why did God require Jesus to follow through with allowing him to be slaughtered like a lamb? Simply because that was the only sacrifice, the only thing that could save us. There is no other way. He could not compromise. Now, also, Jesus did not stay dead. He resurrected in a glorified body and lives on as a real person today in the heavenly kingdom he did not disappear he did not die into oblivion so not that jesus didn't know that he was going to be um he could not be entirely certain just before he offered himself in the during his prayer but he said I wish you could take away, Father, this cup from me, but if, but not my will, but thy will be done. And in uh-huh. that surrender stands all foundations of salvation. And fa- that's exactly why he is my rock. That is the very foundation of my faith, the surrender of his own ego to a higher power. That is his father. He knew that he did not sustain himself. Living in this body, the uh, human Um, body, a sinful body. Also, um, Jonathan asked. um, Sorry, I had had a phone call. I had to. um, Jonathan asked, why was a blood sacrifice necessary? Does God have the. uh, Hold on. Somebody comment. God have the power to just forgive us instead of creating us in sin. The way the way it is that one God did not did not create us in sin. The devil came in and corrupted everything God had done. Now the reason why there was such freedom for the devil to do that or for us to choose is because of the simple fact that what kind of God would he be if he made us like robots to worship him or what kind of glory would he receive if he made us all perfect just to worship him and that's it. Like we were literally meant to worship him. He wouldn't know if we loved them or not because we were meant to just worship him. But when he gave us, when he sent his son and and that was his blood sacrifice. Because the thing is, before Jesus, man and God were completely disconnected. 
There was no way that people, people were so wicked, you could not get into heaven like that. So when God sent his son Jesus to die on the cross for us, that was like our, our bridge to go to Jesus and to go to, to get to God because Jesus says, no one can get to the father except through me. Now, if you decide not to, you're not accepting the gift of salvation. So you're telling God, I want to keep my wicked ways. But the thing is, God could have also destroyed everybody. Like, you know what? You're wicked. I'm not sending my son. It's done. But God sent his son so we can have a way to be with him to show how fair he is. God it's just like his, in the. God sent his son to take upon himself the punishment, the consequences of what we deserved. Take upon himself what we deserve, the consequences of our sins, so that we could live where he deserves to live in heaven. Now, and I would like to bring this conversation to a little close. I would like to mention that, Ruby, maybe you need to start your own blog. Not because I, in any way I don't love you. Uh, it is just because it is not serving the purpose of my blog. First of all, my point is biblical entrepreneurship. And my other reason for this blog to be that my voice would be heard and that the things would be going according to the th directions of thinking where I enjoy I so going. That if, if that you would like to start your own blog, you're more welcome to it. I just would really not like to play the second okay. fiddle in mine. And no, um, no I'm sorry if, it, if no, I made you feel like it, you took you control. You are very enthusiastic. Is... You're full of fire, and I love that about you. Okay? Yeah, it's just like <laughs> when I came in, you guys were like, this, debating already this, so i yes. kind of wanted to help you <laughs> what 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 it was really an ex extremely unique experience for me that today most of the people who showed up in my blog were atheists and you know that god wants us to meet everybody where they are at if i go there with a fanatical mind of 100 percent conviction then they cannot relate i know that i need to leave room for god to show his miracles in my life still i am not perfect i am perfect made perfect by jesus and his blood in my life but that is also conditional do you know what that condition is it is to remain faithful till the end even god knows that we we are not 100 percent completely perfect even with with the blood of jesus over us he also knows that until the last breath we take we are capable of sin. Therefore, the condition is to remain faithful till the very end. Thank you very much, Ruby, that you have come up today. It is definitely um, um, added to the, the brilliance of this blood today. I enjoy it so infinitely much today. If so I will, wants to continue. I will be glad to have you anytime again. Okay. Um, if anybody does want to continue, you can follow like a conversation like this. You can follow me and I can try to make a blab because I don't know how to really do it. So I got to like play around with that. Just get started. I only started a week ago. There is so many religious topics and scientific topics around here. Everybody is should be attracting their own crowd. And I enjoy having anybody here. It is just gets very complicated when more than one conversation is happening at the same time. So, um, I apologize for that, but there is only one uh, conversation can be had at the same time. And you at any time welcome to come back again. Maybe just, um, I don't know, we just, like in any meeting, we just have to keep on topic. <laughs> As really, I created this blog for biblical entrepreneurship. And if I got people, scientists today, most of the time, I enjoy the encounter. I've grown a tremendous. Thank you very much, everybody. Bye. Uh, Michael, how do you know it was your God that changed the crystals and not Zeus? I think I answered the question, this question, when I said there is nothing to prove um oh i mean in the water crystals that's what you mean um what i know for sure is the good intentions the blessing that changed the water crystals there is no need to name the god behind it anybody uh, in their own faith is welcome to call it according to their god 
the only thing I know for sure is that the, the my God that I worship is good. And I call him God because he's the only source of all good things. Apart from his, there is no good in this universe. And in him, there is no impurities, no sin, and nothing that is not good. That's my definition. If somebody tries to force that into a box of a person, that person, uh, because we only can imagine pers um, a personal God by putting them into little box of bodies, that is their choice. I know that no good can flow out of a bad source and no bad can flow out of a good source. There is only good and evil in this world. The combina there, is, there is only good and there is only evil in this world. How do you know your God is the correct God? Because it is Satan's trickster and thinking to imagine and wanting to say that there is goodness outside of God. The name of God is not an accident. We call it God because it's good. If, if you believe that good can be a little bit bad, then you're already talking about um, a mix, a hybrid of good and bad. Then you are, that the word good is absolute. What about Muhammad or Vishnu? Muhammad is a prophet and Vishnu is um, a version of a, a god. I would like to call it the my god, but I don't want to uh, offend the Vishnu's Krishna followers. What I know is that none of them claims to be the son of God. My prophet, Jesus, was a prophet on earth. And the prophets don't lie. I got that conviction from other Muslims on this blog before. And if prophets don't lie, then my prophet Jesus Christ does not lie either. And he claims to be the son of God and he claims to be the son of man. And I, I have to believe in it because I know that prophets don't lie. You can't say that truth lies. Just as well, you cannot say that God, good is a little bit bad in these guys. That is like totally redefining the dictionary or something. Okay, Mohammed was supposed was a supposed prophet. Well, I don't know much about Mohammed in the sense that I didn't um, actually study him, but I know that he's called a prophet. Whether if his prophecies had been fulfilled, now that would be an that's an interesting research because the uh, F F prophet, what defines a prophet? The prophet prophesies of the future in order to convince God's believers that God convince God's people about the existence of God, that there is something higher. Prophecy is, is not a fortune telling, is not a future telling. It basically gives you a fact now so that when it is fulfilled, you would be convinced that you have heard the voice of God. There can be no prophet that claims to be a prophet, but his prophecy is not fulfilled. Because God does not give prophecies and does not give you information and don't follow up on it. The God is absolute. He, if he starts something, he finishes it. That's one of the characteristics of knowing God's actions, that he starts it and finishes it too. He's, he doesn't do a halfway job because he's, he can see all things into the future as well. So he's not wasting his time on things that cannot be finished. Is it possible he is the correct God? I think I believe I have answered that question when I said that you have to make a decision about what you call good or bad. If you define good 
is that it has nothing bad in it and you define bad that it is corrupted corrupted goodness then there is no chances of god could be anything else but perfect the name of god has been a much debated topic throughout history you are asking me that is it muhammad or sir now my answer is that the name of god has been a much debated topic throughout history in fact even just the very torah has like i, I don't even want to guess but so many names of god that some of them they don't even want to pronounce because they don't know for sure how it was supposed to be pronounced to begin with they don't want to blaspheme those are the jews but the names of God has been much debated. This is why I am not necessarily cutting out the possibility that people in different religion may be calling it another name. There are some people, there are, okay, Yahweh, my God, can very well have his people hidden among cultures that are of a different religion than Christianity. That's what I try to convey. Okay. Why doesn't it happen? Okay. Jonathan, would you like to come up on air? I'm a little hesitant to continue because I have been here for over three hours. But uh, I much rather would have you up here for a conversation than give little matchbox references here. Yes, there has been thousands and thousands of gods. How do you know yours is the correct one? These are all. Because good, no matter how you call it, in how many languages, is still good. And so is with perfect. Perfect is no matter how many languages you're going to translate it into, it will still be perfect. That's how I know it. There's no perfection outside of God. Jonathan Keith. Yes, there has been thousands. Okay. I am at work and can't. Sorry, but it's okay if you are done. Thank you for answering. Jabrina. Yes, I love science. I don't have to agree with every single little part of it, though. You know, that's the part, that's the whole nature of science. It's incomplete. I believe in a complete God. But yes, I enjoy science because it contemplates the very creation of God. It contemplates the creation of God that I love. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, everybody. Bye-bye.